I think there's a bit of an issue with the mic, so um, I hope you can all hear me. I'll try to use the podium mic. So uh, today we'll start uh, talking about linear models for regression, which are sort of one of the most basic mo uh, models. And I assume you're at least partially familiar with this already. Uh, but we'll, um, well, we'll start with the basics, and then we go a little bit deeper. Maybe two quick announcements in terms of logistics, or, well, one is that, so I'm not going to be here on Wednesday, so Thomas Fan, will be, uh, who's also a scikit-learn core developer and who's working with me, will be doing the uh, lecture on classification because I'll be at a workshop in Seattle. Um, and the other thing is that, um, this was maybe a little bit unclear in the homework, when it talks about uh, tuning the parameters, um, so which parameters to tune is, it's mostly the regularization and we'll talk about this um, in quite a bit of detail both today and on Wednesday. So um, you don't have to tune all the parameters, only the important parameters, which is mostly regularization. Um, before we start with the linear models, um, I wanna finish up a little bit uh, of what we talked about last week, which is dealing with missing values, which you'll also need for the homework. So very commonly, measurements are m missing in data, no matter how they are recorded. Um, and very commonly, it's quite uh, annoying. So w um, one of the first issues, uh, if you're using Python at least, is that NumPy doesn't have a standard format for dealing with missing values. People often use uh, np.nan, but it only works in float and not in int. Um, Pandas does have uh, real encoding for missing values, but um, I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, scikit-learn always works on NumPy arrays. So scikit-learn doesn't really know a lot of Pandas, and so um, if you have missing values, you need to make sure that they're really um, properly encoded because uh, said like NumPy doesn't really have a standard encoding for it. If someone gives you a data set, um, first thing you figure out is how are missing values encoded? Um, <laughs> so often they're an A or unknown or something. I think two years ago, uh, there was a homework in this uh, class where I gave people a data set from um, the city of Boston where missing value was encoded by nines. And the number of nines depended on the longest, um, the longest number in that column. So each column had a different way to encode missing value. And this was nine or nine nine or nine 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 or nine 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 nine, depending on how long the column was. So that was really easy to do. So one of the things that I'm not going to talk about is um, missing output because that's semi-supervised learning and that sort of goes beyond the class. Basically, for now, if you have if your target is missing, um, the best way you can do it really is to throw away that row, and uh, because you can't learn a supervised model on it. In the following, I'm I'll mostly talk about how to deal with missing values. Um, in continuous variables and how to fill them in. Um, another thing that is often informative is actually knowing that a value was missing. So it's not always the best to just sort of pretend you knew the value, even if you could figure it out perfectly. Uh, very commonly, there's something inherent in the process, a reason why th something was missing. If you look at medical data, for example, uh, orders don't, uh, sorry, doctors order, don't order tests at random. They order tests that they think will be informative. So if you know which tests the doctor ordered, in, in other words, which values are actually measured and are not missing, this will give you a lot of information about what the doctor thought. Um, yeah, there's a thing to add an indicator for whether the value was missing in scikit-learn using the missing indicator or all the imputer I'll talk about have like a parameter now that allows you to add an indicator. So let's start with uh, a toy example. So what I actually did here was um, I used the iris data set and then I added some NANs so that we can see what happens if we add NANs in different ways. 
the, the first two simple cases I want to discuss is, well, if either a row or a column is mostly missing. If a row is mostly missing, depending on like how frequently it is missing, you might just be better off throwing away the column. You should try to figure out uh, or try to measure how informative is the column um, and like that if something's basically always missing and maybe the missingness is not informative, um, we also say missing completely at random means the missingness is, is not informative, then maybe uh, the best thing is to just throw away the column entirely. If you have rows that are missing, the situation is actually a little bit more tricky because um, if you're building a production system, usually you're required to give, you, give a target for every input. So if, you have a, uh, if you're a bank and you want to decide someone credit worthy or not, um, you have to sort of produ produce either a certainty or like a yes, no answer, and you can't really say, I don't know, unless you design your system specifically to say, I don't know. And so if all values are missing, you have to think about what is the right answer here. Um, for, the, for the training of the model, you might be tempted to just throw these out. But if you do that, then you need to sort of hard code um, for the prediction, what are you going to predict? Or are you maybe going to raise an error and deal with it some other way? Obviously, if all the rows are, sorry, if all the columns are missing for a row, all the predictions will be the same. So this row here will have the same prediction as this row. And so you have to figure out, does that make sense uh, in the context of the application? If you know that, you will only have missing values during your training, tra training data collection and you don't have missing values uh, in your production setting, then you can drop them safely. All right, but so basically don't just drop them and hope you're not gonna encounter them again in the future. So the main way to deal with missing values though is imputation. Imputation just means filling in the missing values. And so this is important because most machine learning models cannot deal with missing values. Particularly, we're gonna talk about linear models. Linear models have no way to deal with missing values. Uh, some tree-based models can deal with missing values and it depends a little bit on the implementation. In scikit-learn, for example, uh, gradient boosting can deal with missing values, but I don't think any other model can deal with missing values. There's, uh, I'd say, like basically three or four common ways that imputation is done. The most simple is median or mean imputation. So you basically just, whenever there's a missing value in a column, you replace it with a mean or median. Um, so this is uh, very simple. This is actually the most common way and often works pretty well. Then you can do um, basically machine learning model-based approaches, either using nearest neighbors or regression models, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. And uh, finally, there's uh, matrix factorization approaches, um, which try to impute all of the columns in a missing data, uh, in a data set as one, at once. By basically by getting, finding a latent representation of the data and then trying to use this latent representation to fill in missing values. But we'll focus on the first three. So again, this is um, a toy data set and I created that toy data set in a way that uh, the, missing the missingness is actually informative. But so um, again, this is sort of um, iris data set that with missing values introduced. So here, uh, uh, there's only two columns. So there's four columns in total. The last two have missing values. And if I just drop them, I get an accuracy of 0.77. Um, very often, or not very often, but sometimes, all of the rows, ha sorry, all of the rows have some missing values, sorry. All of the columns have some missing values. 
if all of the columns have missing values, obviously there's no way to drop them and still keep any data. So uh, dropping only works if you have like a limited set of um, columns that have missing values. So the next thing is mean or median imputation. Um, so this you can do with the simple imputer in scikit-learn. So simple imputer they can do either constant imputation or median imputation or mean imputation. It's a transformer, um, works like any other transformer in scikit-learn. You call fit and then you call transform. And what it will do, it will just impute the value with the mean on the training set or the median. And you can see that because it's very simple, each of the NAND values in a given column uh, will be replaced with the same value. Um, the way this data set was constructed, in this case, this is actually really bad. Um, so if you remember the iris data set, so that if you're supposed to have the blue points here, the orange points here, and the green points over here, but the green points had a lot of missing values. And if we um, replace them with um, the mean, then basically, if, the missing, if there's a missing value in pedal length, they're gonna be moved here. If there was a missing value in pedal, pedal width, they're gonna be moved here. And if there's a missing value in both, they're just gonna sit here in the center. So that's not really uh, that great. Actually, um, in many real world application, median imputation works fine. Um, it's definitely the first thing I would try. And so for, for the homework, this is also what I expect you to use. Um, feel free to play around with any of the others, but if you just do median imputation, that's enough. Um, so here, because I designed the data set in sort of uh, a mean way, actually doing uh, median imputation is much worse than uh, just throwing away the columns because it introduces a lot of like noise into the process. So k imputation is um, in a sense much more elaborate. In k imputation, you find the k nearest neighbor that have uh, non-missing values for the um, column you want to impute. So you do this one column at a time. Let's say you want to impute the first column. You go uh, for the first missing value you encounter. You f uh, figure out the, the k neighbors, say five neighbors or three neighbors or 50 that um, have non-missing values in the first column and you take the average of them. It's um, a little bit more tricky than that because you can't really compute distances because you have missing values. And so there are specific distance matrices, uh, metrics that account for the missing values and you basically only compute the distances on the values that are not missing in, um, in both rows. So this is much more adaptive, so now every value will be impl um, imputed potentially in a different way, and so the structure of the data set is much more preserved. As I said, for other nearest neighbor-based models, this is obviously very slow for large data sets because you have to find the neighbors repeatedly. So if you have like a million points, this will take forever. But, yeah, so this is sort of a classical technique that might work well on smaller data sets. And um, it's basically like very easy to use. You just have to specify K. Um, and the final method that uh, is basically uh, model-based imputation. In model-based imputation, um, you train a regression model to predict the missing column from the other columns. So often initially you would um, just impute in some simple way, say using a median imputer, and then you, you would remember which values were missing, 
and then you train, say, a random forest classifier to predict the missing values in the first column from all the other columns. Then you would fill them in, and you would predict the uh, uh, missing values in the second column using all the other columns. And so you iterate over the columns and fill in the missing values based on a regression model trained on the other columns. And you can iterate over the data set multiple times because every time you do the imputation, you change the features on which the models are trained. So this is implemented in the iterative imputer, and it's iterative because you go over all the uh, columns you want to impute multiple times. Uh, this is commonly done either with um, random forests or linear models, but in principle you can use everything, anything. So the using random forest is known as, I think, misforest. Misforest is like an R package that people really like to use. Um, the problem with the way this is done in scikit-learn right now is basically this will never converge. So you would, you would assume that um, basically if you keep filling in the missing values based on the features you observed and you iterate over the data set and you keep filling in, that after you go over your data set a hundred times, um, like it will stop changing. But it just never converges, it never stops changing. And uh, so in the original paper, the people said, well, we wait until the error, st the error in the prediction starts going up. And if the error starts going up, we stop. That's not really how convergence usually works. And so the iterative computer will, if you use the random force, will always tell you there's a convergence issue. issue. Because the, the algorithm as it's presented in the paper just doesn't converge. It still works, but it never converges. Anyway, if you do this uh, here on my Troy data set, so here this was with um, the KNN, and here it is with the uh, random forest, and my synthetic toy data set is slightly worse, but um, both of them give you pretty reasonable imputation, and the random forest has the benefit of uh, being much faster on bigger data sets, and it's also easier to deal with mixtures of categorical and continuous variables. Well, in the features, if you need to impute categorical continuous variables at the same time, it's a little bit tricky. Maybe what I should say here, for, for categorical variables, people don't usually do imputation. They usually just encode it as a separate value. So if you have a missing value in a categorical feature, usually you just you add a new cat category, call it category missing, and uh, that's it. So you, don't, you, you do imputation usually only for continuous variables. Questions about uh, any of the imputation things? No. All right. And again, as we talked about with um, other preprocessing things, uh, it's important that you like use pipelines and or just fit on the train data set if you do cross validation, uh, because. If you do imputation, again, you might leak information about the data distribution um, during cross-validation. So you can, in this, as I did in this case, just build a pipeline from your imputer and your uh, whatever preprocessing and model you want to do. All right. So now let's talk about linear models for particular linear models for regression. So as you're probably familiar with, so linear models are those that um, predict a target, uh, I call it like y hat here, as uh, an inner product of some features x with some coefficient vector uh, w uh, plus some offset b. And so if you do this in 1D, um, there's a slope and there's an offset, and uh, hopefully you've done that in high school. And so um, all the linear models for regression use basically this formula for prediction. Um, the difference is how they find these Ws and Bs. So given the training data set, we want to figure out um, what, what should the coefficients Ws be and the offset or bias be 
to fit our training data set uh, well and to allow us to generalize. Side note, they're called linear models, not because they're linear in XI, the XI here are the features, but because they're linear in the WIs. Uh, you could also add features to the XI, like you could do a squared of an XI and would still be a linear model. Um, that's actually one of the strengths in linear models is you could just like do some feature engineering on the X side and still um, easily solve the, uh, the model. The version that you're probably most familiar with of this is um, ordinarily squares. So in ordinarily squares, um, the way I find W and B is I do an optimization um, in which I try to minimize the squared loss of, um, or the squared error of W transpose XI plus B minus YI. So here on my training data set, I have like the, my XIs and my YIs, and what this measures is the, uh, the distance between um, the prediction, W transpose XI plus B, and the actual value that I observed, that is YI. And, um, Actually, give me one second. I should make this formula more clear. Um, so basically what it says is fit the training data as much as possible where goodness of fit is used by the sum of squares. This has a unique solution um, if X has full column rank, which means, uh, which implies um, that there's basically no correlated features, but it also implies that you have more rows than you have columns. So if you have like what's called the long skinny matrix, this is uh, probably gonna work fine. So if you have 10 features and uh, 10,000 samples, this is probably fine. Um, I mean, this is obviously like a nice classical method, goes back to Gauss, uh, great. If you have more, uh, columns, oh my God, I'm, I'm confusing columns and rows to, all day today. So if you have more columns than you have rows, then uh, this doesn't work anymore. Or <laughs> it's actually kind of tricky to make this work and make it well-defined. Um, you have this very commonly in like, uh, let's say in medicine, in biology, where like if you do genetics, if you do drug testing, um, very often you have very few rows because whatever you're doing is very expensive to do, but you have a wide array of measurements. Um, and if you work in sensor arrays, you might have similar things. So one way to overcome this issue is uh, called rich regression. And rich regression is very similar to uh, linear regression in that we also trying to um, fit the training data, which is this first term. It's the sum over all the training samples and then the squared loss on the training data. But then there's also another term, which is uh, alpha times the length of W. And because this is a minimization problem, or which, so we're trying to minimize this, the first term is best if we fit the da train data well. The second term is uh, optimum if W is very small. You could think of this as saying, um, <laughs> we want to fit the train data well, but the slope in each direction should be small. If the slope in any direction is very high, then we get penalized. <laughs> Alpha here is a tuning parameter or a hyperparameter um, that you have to set, uh, say, a, uh, using grid search. This always have you, has a unique solution if alpha is non-zero. If you set alpha to zero, obviously you have uh, linear regression again. If you uh, set alpha to infinity, you get an all zeros vector. And so somewhere in between, this allows you to trade off between um, some notion of simplicity, so having small slopes and fitting the training data set well. As a sort of, um, a sort of separate note, this is, basically how nearly all of machine learning works. Um, there, there's a very general framework that a lot of machine learning theory builds on, which is called regularized empirical risk minimization. 
And so I just want to briefly mention this, and you've probably seen this uh, in your theory class, if you did a theory class. Basically, all of machine learning is that I start with a family of functions. So in our example, this was all linear models. Could also be all neural networks or all support vector machines or anything like that. And you want to find a function. So the family of functions is this capital F that we want to um, find the best one of. And we want to find the best in this family that is uh, works well on a training data set, but is also simple. And the works well on a training data set is measured by some loss function. In our case, for the linear models, this was just a squared error. And so you sum the loss over all the samples in a training data set. That's, sort of, that's known as the data fitting term also. And then there's your second term, alpha times um, R of F. And R is called the regularizer. This says my function f should also be simple. And so you, there's a tuning parameter alpha that tells you how should I trade off fitting the data well versus requiring my model to be simple. And so we'll see this again and again for the classification models, for support vector machines, um, for neural networks. Basically, the, the things that we change are the family of functions that we're going over, um, the loss function we're using. So on Wednesday for classification, we can't use the uh, squared error anymore. And then potentially the regularization that we're using. But um, overall, this is like most of supervised machine learning can be formalized in this way. And this, this should remind you of uh, this plot that I showed about how model complexity and generalization interact. Basically, this alpha is the alpha that allows you to change from fitting a training data set very well to restricting your model to be very simple. So for all of the linear models that we're going to talk about, we'll have this parameter alpha. Um, and the classification models, uh, it's called C. And this allows as to say, well, how much do I want to focus on really fitting the training data set well versus how much do I want to focus on um, keeping the model simple? The way I showed this here, high alpha means a small model. So high alpha would be, sorry, high alpha means a simple model, a small coefficient vector w. So alpha equal to 100 would be over here versus alpha equal to 0.001 would be over here. If I have a very small value of alpha, I try to fit the training data uh, set very well, but this might not allow me to generalize very well. And so that's the motivation for keeping the model simple is to um, allow better generalization. All right, so now I want to, this was like, very, very abstract in that I described basically all of machine learning. Now let's come back to linear models and do this on um, an actual data set. So the, I'm using the Ames housing data set. You can find this on Kaggle. It was uh, basically curated um, for like classroom use. It's in some ways it's somewhat similar to the uh, data set you'll have on the homework. But it, I mean, it's a different it's a different region, so many things will be different. This has um, seventy nine features. Um, many of them continue, some of them categorical, and has uh, about two hundred twenty two hundred uh, samples. Before we um, do build any model. Let's look at the scale. So this is a box plot in log coordinates. And you can see that the lot area, uh, it's in square feet. So it's like much bigger than everything else. You can also see that the year built, well, I don't know. I think some of them are, no, no oh, is it a different data set? So here the year build actually makes sense. I think there were some of the other data sets I looked at where you could see year build was sometimes also zero. 
which is probably not true in the US. Um, but yeah, so orders of magnitude are very different. Um, if you use ordinary least squares, um, you, technically you don't have to scale. Scaling helps you with interpreting the coefficients. Um, and it might be good from a numeric perspective. For rich regression, it's actually very important that you scale because um, if you don't scale your data, you basically you weight the penalty different on different um, on different features, and you don't want to do that. And we don't want to depend on whether the lot area was measured in square feet or square inches or uh, acres or something. Oh, um, I want to very briefly mention the R squared. The definition of R squared I'm using, I think it showed up um, uh, the last lecture already. So this is the definition that we use in scikit-learn. And so the R squared can be negative. Um, basically, it's the distance of the prediction from the, um, from the ground truth divided by the um, difference from the mean. And so if your estimator is biased or if you're using a test set, then your prediction, so this would be zero if you always predict the mean. But may, maybe your prediction is worse than always predicting a mean and then you get a negative number. All right. So here's my uh, model on this. So this is maybe more complicated than the things that I showed before, but I thought it would be nice to um, have like a more complex or more realistic example of pre-processing. So here I'm very heavily using um, pipeline and column transformer. So basically what I'm assembling first is um, a pipeline that will do the pre-processing for the, for the categorical values. I call that cat preprocessing. And I make a pipeline out of a simple computer um, that just fills all missing values with NA. That's sort of what I said earlier. Um, if there's a missing value, you probably should treat it as another category. In this data set, all the columns with missing value, all the, categor all the categorical columns with missing values are strings, so this works. If there was a categorical column with missing values that was encoded as integers, that would fail. Anyway, and so then I would, and then I'm doing a one-hot encoder. Here I'm setting handle unknown to ignore because I'm gonna use this uh, in cross-validation. And if I do cross-validation, there might be new categories in the validation uh, part that were not in the training set. And I just want to ignore those columns and not error. Then uh, for the continuous part, I use a simple imputer and a standard scalar. The simple imputer imputes uh, the me mean by default. So if I used a KNN imputer, I might want to switch the order and first scale and then impute. If I just comp impute the mean, it doesn't matter if I impute first or uh, scale first. Yeah? Yes. Why does it not matter for um, the predicting of the least Okay, the question is why does it not matter for, uh, why does scaling not matter for ordinarily squares? Um, basically, you can write down uh, like x hat is x times a, vec that times a diagonal matrix, and uh, then you write, a, then uh, you basically just write down the optimization, you can see, oh, well, the optimum just changes and the optimum will be the scaled version of W. But there's no other term uh, because you have only the, basically, if you write the scaling as a diagonal matrix, you could put it into the X or into the W and it doesn't matter. Uh, for the rich, because you have a separate term, it's just W, you would get the norm of the diagonal matrix in there. So, all right. So um, 
Then I make a column transformer. Here I'm using the make column selector method from the scikit-learn compose module. And I say, well, use the dtypes that are object. Um, I could also come up with a better way. I could see if the data set has any annotation. So actually, maybe one uh, note for the homework. If you have the current version of scikit-learn, you can, which is 0 uh, dot 0.22.1, I think, you can have this uh, as frame equal to true and fetch OpenML, and then it will tell you which ones are the categorical variables. So then you can do this even better. Okay, so I use um, the categorical preprocessing on the columns that are pre type object, and the remainder I do continuous preprocessing. So this is my column transformer that contains these two pipelines. And um, then I split my data into training and test set. I make a pipeline out of the preprocessing, and in this case, linear regression. So linear regression is ordinarily squares, and I do five fold cross validation and gives me the five R square values. And so the optimum is one, right? So this is actually already pretty good. If we um, look at the target, we can actually see that the targets are pretty skewed. It's very common for prices or if you have count data. Um, so I did a histogram here of the targets. And so a common trick is to do a log of the targets. So you're not required to do this in your homework, but I just want to show how you do that. Um, it might, it would might maybe help for the homework, but yeah. As I said, you don't have to. Um, so the data becomes much more normal where, or less skewed if you apply the log transform. And a linear uh, regression model will usually uh, work better on something that looks more normal. You could also use a generalized linear model and do Poisson regression or something like this maybe, but we're not going to do that. So this is sort of a standard hack that people use uh, to kind of make the data better behaved. Uh, if you want to do this, with scikit-learn in a pipeline. Um, there's a thing called transform target regressor that allows you to transform the target for a regressor. And you can say, uh, you can specify the regressor you want to wrap. So in this case, I'm wrapping the linear regression. The function you want to apply, which is np.log, and the inverse function, which is np.exp. So the reason why I do this is that when I want to measure my R squared, I want to measure the R squared or MSE or whatever I want to measure in the original space. If I didn't do that, if I just called uh, Y train as np.log of Y train, then I would measure the error in the transformed space and that would mean something very different. And so what this does basically is it, it applies log trains the model on the log, does the prediction, and then applies exp on the prediction. So your predictions will actually be in the original space. And so this way, the cross-validation scores are actually comparable, and they're quite a bit better. So you can see that something that's conceptually quite simple, like applying a log to the targets, actually makes the model much better. It also sort of, well, slightly decreases the variance uh, between the cross-validation faults. Questions so far? Okay. Now, let's um, start doing the same thing with Rich. So at the top is just a repetition of doing the pipeline of the preprocessor with the transform target regressor of linear regression. And um, at the bottom is the same with Rich. And um, they're basically the same. Um, but this is sort of rich with the default of alpha equal to one. There's not really a reason why alpha equal to one should be uh, the optimum. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, grid search the parameters. So I'm creating the pipeline anew here. Uh, so I have like nicer naming. So I'm gonna name the preprocessing, preprocessing and I'm gonna name the log rich regression thing rich. If I want to tune the hyperparameters of this thing now, 
I have to say, well, in the pipeline, I want a step that's called ridge, and then the double underscore that I need for grid searching over pipelines. Sorry. Then actually, this is um, this thing is this target transformer, not the ridge regression model. And so the target transformer has an attribute that's called regressor. And if I want to tune the ridge, I have to look at the regressor which is rich, and then double underscore, then, that, then alpha, which is the parameter of rich. So that's like a little bit tricky, but okay. Uh, and then after I defined my um, parameter grid object like this, I put in the pipeline. Um, given that the data set is pretty small, I do a repeated k-fold with uh, five times 10-fold cross-validation and uh, plot the return of the outcome of the model. And you can see here that um, basically if I set uh, the alpha to somewhere around um, like 100, actually uh, the generalization performance is quite a bit better than if I set it to lower. And so the uh, one, which was the default value, which was, was somewhere here, but this seems uh, better. We have very, so here the, the shaded region corresponds to one standard deviation. Um, and so you can see that there's quite a bit of variance between the different cross-validation folds. I also plotted each of the cross-validation folds individually, which you can see here. And you can see that basically the different cross-validation folds, like some of them are just much harder than others. Um, the training set performance is pretty consistent, but you can see that um, basically for each of the cross-validation folds, like the optimum is somewhere in this region and certainly not, not over here. So the regularization helped. All right. So this was sort of um, a very complex like workflow model with like a pipeline that contained a column transformer of pipelines and the target transformer of a regression model. And I want to go back and focus a little bit more on the actual modeling. And so I'm going to use a slightly simpler data set um, for, for the rest of the class. Well, simpler in some sense. Um, so this is the, oh, actually, I don't know how to pronounce this. Are there any medical professionals here that know how to pronounce this? Okay, let's say it's called triazine, maybe triazine. Okay, the triazine data set. So this is a um, drug discovery data set. Um, another thing that you can see here, for both of them, there's actually quite, like the number uh, of features um, to samples is quite high. So we have still, we have less features than samples here, but like by a factor of three. So that's not like, that's not uh, long and skinny, that's pretty wide still. And so we expect that in this data set regularization might help because we have so many features. I looked, I just computed a histogram of the target uh, to see if I should do a log again, but it didn't look like it, it would help. Uh, the data set's actually already pre-processed, uh, which is one of the reasons I picked it here. Um, and so I do cross validation again with my ordinary least squares model and I get this beautiful result that you can see here, uh, which is minus four e to, e to the plus uh, 24. So this is minus four with 24 zeros. Um, so that's really bad, right? That's like impossibly bad. Um, so zero would be as good as breaking the mean. Okay, so this clearly didn't work. If instead I use the rich regression model, um, I get some like reasonable performance even with the default parameters. And so like re linear regression probably fails here because we have strong correlations in the data set. So an alternative approach would be to look at the features, see which are correlated, try to remove the correlated features, um, or like do some feature selection or something like that. Um, or we could just use the ridge regression model and it'll just uh, work much more robustly. 
then we can again um, tune the model. So here, because I'm just putting the ridge into the grid search CV object, I can just specify my parameter grid with alpha and there's no pesky underscores. And again, we can see that um, using some amount of regularization um, here is good. So setting alpha equal to uh, whatever, two, three is, uh, um, is, is quite a bit better than not using regularization, which makes the model completely blow up. Um, so this is sort of looking at the scores, the cross-validation scores. We can also look at the coefficients. So here I just fit the linear model on uh, the training data set and look at the coefficients. As we saw from the scores, basically the, uh, the data is ill-conditioned and so um, it just uh, doesn't work basically. So here I plot on the x-axis the index of the feature and on the y-axis the coefficient. Um, they call it colored uh, blue for positive and red for negative coefficients. And um, well, the, the main thing you should look at is this here. So the coefficients are somewhere in one with 11 zeros. So basically that's just a sign that there's some um, uh, collinearity and there's numerical instability and um, you should probably not use this model. And if you wanted to use linear regression, you would need to do something else with it, with the data beforehand. Or we can just use rich regression. So here I'm using the model that was found as the best estimator in my grid search. Um, so I think I didn't actually print the outcome, unfortunately. Let me, I thought I printed the outcome, but apparently I didn't. Nope. Um, so I think it was three was the best alpha that was found. Um, and so here the coefficients look much more um, reasonable. And from this plot, you could look at what are the most important features. So this is a drug discovery data set, and I have no idea what these features mean. I mean, you could look it up, and whoever made this data set probably knew what they meant, hopefully. But you could see that, for example, this feature and this feature are probably the most informative ones, um, followed by like this and this. Looking at the coefficients also allows us to look at the effect that regularization has. So here I'm comparing three different models. The one that found, was found by grid search, which is the alpha of 3.16, and then say one with a very high alpha and one with a very small alpha. And so in general, you can see that basically if I make the alpha very high, it regularizes the model a lot, which means it squashes the coefficients all towards zero. So if you look at the alpha equal to zero, the green coefficients are all close to zero. So if the alpha equal to 100, the green coefficients are all equal to, or very close to zero. Um, with alpha equal to uh, 0.1, there's much less regularization, you can see the coefficients are much bigger. And the uh, optimum that was found is somewhere in between. But so this is just, in general, the effect is to shrink the coefficient more towards zero. You can see this is not necessarily true for each individual coefficient though. Um, where is it? Here, for example, um, the alpha equal to three has a larger coefficient than the alpha equal to 0.1. So this is only true sort of on average, not for each individual coefficient. Another interesting way to understand the effect of uh, regularization is looking at learning curves. This is learning curves as in statistics, not as in neural networks. What's here on the x-axis is the training set size. So I subsample the data set with um, like the training set with different sizes. So this is not like in neural networks where you have epochs on the, on the x-axis. Here you have different size training sets. Um, and so I plot the accuracy on um, the data set I don't know how pr to pronounce. And again, I compare these three models. 
um, the very strongly regularized green one, the optimum orange one, and the very little regularized blue one. And you can see um, a, the difference between them is the biggest with small data set sizes. The bigger the data set gets, the less I need regularization. Because the more data I have, um, basically, the easier it is to estimate the coefficients well. And if I had many more samples, like if they measured like a thousand more data points, I probably could get uh, rid of regularization overall. You can also see that if I um, set alpha to a smaller value, the training accuracy goes up. So, the train so basically, alpha equal to 0 0.1 lets the model overfit the most. So the dashed blue line, which is the training score for the small alpha, is the highest than the training score for the uh, alpha equal to 3, and then the training score for the alpha equal to 100. You can also see if the training set is very small, then actually setting alpha equal to 100 is better than setting alpha to 3. Though these, okay, the R square is negative here, so both of these models are bad, so maybe it doesn't matter too much. All right. I mean, so we could think about this model, uh, about this uh, plot for a long time, but. Um, there's actually, a, yeah, there's many interesting aspects. So maybe you can, on your own time, you can try to understand sort of what's happening and um, where do the lines cross. So for example, here, uh, you can see that at some training set size, the generalization of the um, alpha equal to three model gets better even than the training set score of the alpha equal to 100. So the alpha equal to 100 is just too restricted to even get as well on the training set. All right. Um, so there was there's uh, another model I want to talk about, which is the lasso model. This is another model for uh, linear regression, and it's very similar to Rich. The only difference is there's a one here instead of a square. And um, so what does this mean? This is the one norm, or the L one norm. And it means we're summing the absolute values instead of the squares. So the Euclidean, we had the squared Euclidean length, which is the sum of squares of the ent entries, whereas um, here we're using the sum of the absolute values. Um, so again, we shrink, so setting alpha to a larger value will shrink the coefficients towards zero, just like in Ridge. However, there's one big difference. This actually sets some of the Ws exactly to zero. What this means is it performs basically automatic feature selection. If the coefficient is zero, it means it doesn't influence the model at all. This, so this is the motivation behind Lasso is to basically completely drop some of the features and so get a model that is um, maybe more interpretable uh, or um, more compact. So there's there's caveats to both of these. So what you really what you would like to write there in the end is um, use the L zero norm. The L zero norm would mean the number of non-zero coefficients. So what would be great to write down is I want the thing that predicts best on the training set using the least amount of features. So I wrote this down here. So the L0 norm is just the number of coefficients that are non-zero. The L1 norm is the sum of absolute values, and the L2 norm is the um, uh, sum of squares. And um, so you would like to do this L2, uh, L0 thing, but that's actually not possible. If you look at this function, this function is really, really nasty if you look at it as a, a function of the entry w. So if you try to find your w, 
basically there's like a zero loss at zero and then all around it you get a loss of one for making it non-zero and that's very hard to optimize there's actually there's some really cool work like two years ago or something by Cynthia Rudin on how to do this well for if you have very few features you can do this but in generally this is NP hard and as you might know NP hard usually means we don't want to do it um, and so basically the idea is that the L1 norm is um, sort of uh, like a convex relaxation of the L0 norm. Um, sort of. And so basically you're trying to approximate the properties of the L0 norm with the L1 norm. And surprisingly, well, depending on how, how well your optimization theory is, surprisingly it works. I want to um, briefly illustrate this with a 1D example. So here, I have three functions. So let's say this function f is whatever my data fitting term. Like my data fitting, ter data fitting term is uh, some quadratic formula. Let's say it's this. Um, like this is a sum over all samples and so on. So in reality, it would look much more complicated. But let's say it looks simple like the blue line. If we add the add something like an L2 uh, penalty, you add something like a just a squared entry. And so then what you're doing is the optimum was here, and now you're moving it over here. So you're moving the optimum towards zero but you're probably not gonna actually hit the zero, which means the, a zero coefficient. Whereas if you use the uh, absolute value, you're actually introducing a kink into the function and the kink in the function will be at exactly zero. And so this sort of makes it more likely that um, the optimum will be at zero. I was Yeah, I also have this picture, but I think I might, might skip this because it re requires you to think about Lagrangian duals. And so uh, let's just uh, tune the parameters. Um, so again, oh, this is something I haven't, I don't think I mentioned for the rich. For both rich and alpha, uh, for both rich and lasso, and generally um, for most of these uh, regularization strengths, we want to tune them on a logarithmic scale. So we don't want to like tune them, well, we want to tune them usually between zero and one, but we don't want to tune them at like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. We want to go for, uh, basically from like 10 to the minus five to 10 to the two, um, two or something. Well, 10 to the two is not between zero and one, but I think you get what I'm saying. So you want to tune them on a logarithmic scale. And so here I'm doing this with log space. Um, and then, oh, actually, I, I removed the normalized equal to true. I just forgot to remove it from the slide, but so it, just ignore that. And then I'm doing uh, my grid search uh, with over alpha, and I find uh, alpha equal to 0 0.0016 is the optimum, and I get an R square, a cross validated R square of 0 0.16. So this is somewhat worse than. Um, it was in uh, rich, I think, but it's not too bad. Again, I'm plotting the training set R square and test set R square here, and you can see that um, there's an optimum somewhere here, well, which is at uh, 0 0.0016, which is here. So here again, you can see that. I um, plotted them on a log, sorry, I picked them on a log scale. So there, you can see there's a data point here, 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 here. So I probably should have marked the data points. Um, but yeah, so they're, they're not, um, they're not done uh, uniformly there on logarithmic scale. What I also plotted in here is the number of non-zero values. So this is like, I did like a twin, twin X and on the right hand side, with the, uh, with the black line, you have the number of non-zero entries. 
And so basically, I think there are 60 features. If you set alpha to 10 to the minus 5, um, like 45 of them are non-zero. But if you, if you increase the alpha to uh, 1, you made all of them zero. So this here is a zero model. Um, and you can see that there's sort of some trade-off between having um, more coefficients that are equal to zero. So here at the optimum, we have like 12 coefficients or something like that. Um, if we wanted to have a simpler model, let's say we only wanted to have um, maybe around four coefficients here, we could still achieve a pretty good R square. Um, plotting the coefficients, uh, we can immediately see this. Uh, so of the 60 features here, actually for the optimum, we see that 13 coefficients were uh, not equal to zero. And um, these were a couple of the ones that uh, we, we saw earlier were important. And yeah, so, so more ones and most of them are zero. Um, one thing that I should uh, caution you about is that there's like the lasso is not very stable in which features it selects. If you have two features that are highly correlated, it will select one of them. But which one might depend on how you subsample your data. So right now, it might have like dropped this feature and said this one is very important. It could still be that these, both of these are very correlated, and if I resample my training data set, uh, it's the opposite way around. So just because a, a coefficient is set to, set to zero, it doesn't mean the feature is not informative. It just means the information that's contained in the feature is already um, represented in the model in some other way. So generally, whenever you have correlated groups of features, Lasso will pick one of them. All right. And so, finally, we can combine these two into what's known as the elastic net. So the elastic net um, basically has alpha 1 times uh, the L1 norm plus alpha 2 times the L2, uh, L2 norm squared. And so we have more parameters to tune. This is clearly a generalization of um, both the lasso and the, the rich regression. And people find that um, it, it often works better in practice. Um, the parameterization in scikit-learn is actually uh, this year, which is you have uh, alpha times eta times the L1 norm plus alpha times 1 minus eta the L2 norm. So eta is called L1 ratio. Set L1 ratio to 1, you have lasso. If you have that L1 ratio to 0, you have ridge. Um, so this L1 ratio, actually I'm not sure there's good literature on how to tune it. I think people usually have it either close to 1 or close to 0. And so they have like mostly ridge with a little bit of lasso or mostly lasso with a little bit of ridge. Um, but uh, yeah, I should see if there's actually a good paper on this um, and or write one. So now I'm searching over two-dimensional space where I'm searching over alpha anti L1 ratio. Um, I have the elastic net, and um, so I find that the L1 ratio, that alpha of 0 0.001 and an L1 ratio of 0 0.9 um, works well on the theta set. The best score is actually not, not that great, um, but, but we have a model that only has uh, 10 non-zero coefficients. I think actually, if you look at the test set score, the test set score was pretty decent. If you want to visualize the uh, grid search result for two-dimensional grid, it's a little bit trickier um, because, like, 
it's 2D, so I'm usually using heat maps. There's also other ways you could do it. Um, and you can see that basically the good parameter settings are all the ones that have an L1 ratio that is like um, very high, very close to one, and alpha around 0 0.001. So these all seem to be pretty good. And I could now like try to search more closely in this neighborhood if I want to. All right, but so hmm. I'm not entirely sure. So the homework definitely asks, I think, for ri for ridge and lasso. I'm not sure if I'm also asking for elastic net. Um, but um, so that's uh, basically more general, but requires you to do more tuning. So that's all I had for today, actually. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. Oh, the question is, what is the score in, in grid search and cross-validation? And so for regression, by default, it's R square. Uh, R square, not adjusted R square. There's. Um, you can pick also other metrics. There's a scoring parameter, and you can give it a string. Though I don't think adjusted R square is one of them because it doesn't make a lot of sense for most models. There were negative scores. This is the definition of R squared I'm using. All right, thanks.